Hello everyone and welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Theory Lectures. Today we're going to do a very brief overview of an enormous field of nuclear engineering, reactor kinetics. Up until now we've discussed reactor statics, which involves solving for eigenvalues and neutron fluxes for steady state time independent systems. Reactor kinetics and reactor dynamics seek to understand how a reactor responds in time dependent simulations. Typically, we're modeling the reactor's response to some sort of reactivity insertion, a change in the moderator temperature or density, or some sort of transient event. So how does a reactor respond to these kinds of changes? Well, let's start out with a very, very simple model, that the power P of a reactor is equal to its initial power, P0, to the power of T over lambda. This lambda term is known as the prompt neutron generation time, which is simply the amount of time that it takes, on average, for one neutron to produce another neutron through fission. Lambda is about equal to 10 to the minus 4 for thermal systems, and 10 to the minus 6 seconds for fast systems, where, of course, things move much faster. Because lambda is the time it takes for our neutron to produce another neutron, this T over lambda term in our equation above is really just the number of times that a neutron gets to continue in the chain reaction, basically how many times it gets to have another step through the chain reaction chain. If k effective is greater than 1, then each step in our chain reaction will, on average, generate more neutrons and increase the power of our system. So let's say we insert a small 20 cent reactivity insertion into our system. We'll discuss what cents and dollars mean later, but for now just know that this is a relatively minor change in our system. This reactivity change will cause the reactor power to increase because the system is now supercritical. And let's say that our reactor operator wants to keep things critical and responds as fast as they can by inserting the control rods. Now, the average human reaction time is about 0.25 seconds, and the fastest human reaction time pretty much ever recorded is 0.101 seconds. So let's say that our reactor operator is the the Usain Bolt of reactors, the Hungry Box, or the Michael Jordan of reactors, so they can respond actually in about 0.1 seconds. In that time, the reactor power will have increased by 172% for a thermal reactor, and it will have increased by a factor of 2.557 times 10 to the 43 for a fast reactor. Clearly, this model is not realistic. Thermal reactors operate all the time without having such huge destabilizing power swings, and we've actually operated fast reactors at steady state without blowing up the universe. So why is our naive model incorrect? Our model is wrong for two reasons, delayed neutrons and feedback. So let's talk about delayed neutrons. Most of the neutrons in a reactor are emitted promptly, which means that they're emitted about 10 to the negative 14 seconds after a fission occurs but less than about 1% of neutrons are emitted with a delay on the order of 0.1 to 1.0 seconds. These neutrons are known as delayed fission neutrons, and they're actually not emitted from fission despite their name. They're actually emitted by fission products as they begin to undergo radioactive decay. These fission products are neutron rich, so they tend to decay by emitting neutrons. The variable beta or beta effective, is known as the delayed neutron fraction, and as its name suggests, it is just the fraction of neutrons emitted from fission in our system that are emitted by these delayed neutron precursors. Beta is about 0 0.0065 for uranium-235, and about 0 0.0020 for plutonium-239, meaning that plutonium releases fewer delayed neutrons and actually is more difficult to control than a uranium reactor. These delayed neutron fractions might not sound very significant, but they're actually significant enough for us to control a reactor. All reactors are operated so that they're actually subcritical if you only consider prompt neutrons. They must have delayed neutrons to be able to maintain a critical chain reaction. This means that power increases in a reactor are really constrained by the time scale on which delayed neutrons are emitted, which is seconds to tenths of seconds not nanoseconds like prop neutrons. This really slows things down and makes our reactors very controllable. Now, when a reactor's k-effective exceeds 
1 plus its beta effective value, it is now supercritical using only prompt neutrons, which means that its power goes back to increasing exponentially at a mind-blowing, and possibly reactor-blowing, rate. Now another key concept in kinetics is the reactivity of a system. Reactivity simply measures how far a reactor is above or below being critical, basically how super or subcritical it is. And reactivity is just equal to the reactor's K effective minus one divided by K. Reactivity is usually expressed in units of dollars and cents, where one dollar of reactivity means that K effective is equal to one plus beta effective. Thus, one dollars of reactivity will make our reactor enter the dreaded prompt supercritical regime. The term cents is just one one hundredth of a dollar, since there are a hundred cents in a dollar. These dollar and cent terms were actually developed by scientists at Los Alamos during the Manhattan Project. Just like the terms barns or shakes, dollars and cents were used so that the scientists could go to bars, restaurants, or other public places and keep discussing work, as nuclear engineers tend to do, without revealing classified topics. The power of reactors that are either subcritical or supercritical but not prompt supercritical can be approximated using this equation, where rho is our reactivity from above, and the little lambda is the average decay constant for our delayed neutron emission. Because all commercial reactors operate in this regime, except for Chernobyl during its accident, this equation can be used to approximate how a reactor's power will respond to changes or reactivity insertions. Now, what happens when things get prompt supercritical? The Nordheim-Fuchs model is a relatively simple, yet fairly effective way for predicting a reactor's power doing a prompt supercritical excursion. During this kind of excursion, a reactor's power will increase exponentially at first, and then eventually level off and then start to decrease. The shape of this power curve is fairly Gaussian-like. The maximum power that a reactor sees, P max, during this excursion is actually inversely proportional to the prompt neutron lifetime, and the width of the peak in time is actually directly proportional to lambda. So why does our power actually peak and then start dropping off instead of increasing forever and ever and causing the next big bang? Well, the power peaks and eventually lowers because of something known as feedback. In general, reactor kinetics describes a system's time-dependent behavior without feedback, and reactor dynamics describes this time-dependent behavior with feedback. Feedback refers to the set of phenomena that cause a reactor to become less reactive as its power increases and as it heats up. The mechanisms for feedback include Doppler broadening, which we have already discussed to an extent, and some other mechanisms include a loss of moderation, because the moderator either becomes less dense as it heats up or even because it boils away, and also fuel expansion. For fuel expansion, the neutron leakage is proportional to a fuel's surface area. So as a reactor heats up, the fuel will begin to expand and actually have more surface area and allow more neutrons to leak out of our system. Feedback provides an inherent safety mechanism in the reactors. As the reactor heats up, it would become more and more difficult to keep it critical, which prevents any kind of destructive runaway reaction. Reactivity temperature coefficients, which are just derivatives for K effective with respect to temperature, describe how these feedback mechanisms will lower the reactivity of our system. Generally, reactor operators require that our reactivity coefficients are negative so that our feedback mechanisms will prevent this kind of runaway chain reaction. But in reality, having coefficients that are too negative can be bad too. Very large negative reactivity coefficients can result in some dangerously large power oscillations throughout the core. One example of this in BWRs is the phenomenon known as chugging. And reactivity coefficients, if they can become too large and too negative, can actually cause the coefficients to interfere destructively, resulting in a net positive coefficient. This completes our brief excursion into reactor kinetics and reactor dynamics. If you are interested, I also teach a course, a graduate course, called Nuclear Reactor Kinetics and Dynamics, where I dive into this topic in much, much more detail.